Hey guys, just to do a bit more research, this is um, Biography Part 2 in Postmodern Mythology. I just wanted to explore Leo Strauss a bit deeper. So, he was trained in the Neo-Kantian tradition with Ernst Cassirer. And later on it talks about how he was... Um, He boarded with the Marburg Cantor Strauss, no relation. The Cantor's residence served as a meeting place for followers of the Neo-Kantian philosopher Hermann Cohen. So I wanted to read about Hermann Cohen to start with and then look at Neo-Kantianism. Hermann Cohen was a German-Jewish philosopher, one of the founders of the Marburg School of Neo-Kantianism, and he is often held to be probably the most important Jewish philosopher of the 19th century. Education, Jewish Theological Seminary of Breslau, University of Breslau, University of Berlin, University of Halle. Region Western Philosophy School, Neo-Kantianism, brackets, Marburg School. Thesis, die systematischen Begriff in Kant's for Kritischen Schriften nach ihrem Verhältnis zum Christian Idealismus, the systematic terms in Kant's pre-critical writings according to their relationship to critical idealism. His main interests were ethics. Influences Friedrich Albert Lang and Friedrich Adolf Trendelberg, Trendelenburg. And of course he influenced Ernst Cassirer, Leo Strauss, as well as Paul Natorp, Martin Buber, Peter Strauss and Henry E. Allison. Lithograph by Karl Dorbecker. Biography. Cohen was born in Coswig, Anhalt, and he early began to study philosophy and soon became known as a profound Kant scholar. He was educated at the gymnasium at Dessau, at the Jewish Theological Seminary of Breslau, and at the universities of Breslau, Berlin, and Halle. In 1873, he became Privat docent in the philosophical faculty of the University of Marburg. The thesis with which he obtained the Vinia Legendi being Die Systematischen Begriff in Kant's Volkritischen Schriften nach ihrem Verhaltnis zum Kritischen Idealismus. Cohen was elected Professor Extraordinarius at Marburg in 1875 and Professor Ordinarius in the following year, see academic ranks in Germany. He was one of the founders of the Gesellschaft zur Forderung der Wissenschaft des Judentums, which held its first meeting in Berlin in November 1902. Cohen edited and published Friedrich Albert Lang's final philosophical work, Logisch Studien, Leipzig, 1877, and edited and wrote several versions of a long introduction and critical supplement to Lang's Geschichte des Materialismus. He devoted three early volumes to the interpretation of Kant, Kant's theory of experience, Kant's foundation of ethics, and Kant's foundation of aesthetics. In 1902, he began publishing the three volumes of his own systematic philosophy, Logic de Reinen Erkenntnis, Ethik des Reinen Willens, and Aesthetic des Reinen Gefühls. The planned fourth volume on psychology was never written. Cohen's writings relating more especially to Judaism include several pamphlets, among them Die Kultur 
Geschichtlich Bedeutung des Sabbat, 1881, and Ein Bekenntnis in der Judenfrage, 1880, as well as the following articles. Das Problem der Jüdischen Sittenlehr in the Monatschrift, 1899. Lieber und Gerechtigkeit in den Begriffen Gott und Mensch in Jabuk für Jüdisch Geschichte und Literatur and Autonomy und Freiheit in Gedenbuk für David Kaufman, 1900. Cohen's most famous Jewish works include Religion, der Wunft aus den Quellen des Judentums, brackets Religion of Reason out of the Sources of Judaism, 1919. Duschtum und Judentum, die Nasch den Lieb im Talmud, and Die Ethik des Maimonides. His essay, Die Nationlieb im Talmud, was written at the request of the Marburg Konigliches Langericht, 3rd edition Marburg, 1888. Cohen's Jewish writings are collected in his Judisch Schriften, three volumes, edited by Bruno Strauss, Berlin, 1924. There is an ongoing new academic edition of edition of Cohen's work, edited by Helmut Holsey, Hartwig Weiderbach. An English translation of some of his Jewish writings is available in Reason and Hope selections from the Jewish writings of Herman Cohen, translated by Eva Jospe, 1971. Cohen was outspoken in his opposition to Zionism and its aspiration to create a Jewish state, and thus return the Jews to history. In his view, Judaism was inherently ahistorical, with a spiritual and moral mission far transcending the nationalist aims of Zionism. Despite the above attitude to Zionism, Tel Aviv has a Herman Cohen Street. Cohen is buried in the Weissensee Cemetery in Berlin. Works. English translations are indented. Die Platonisch Eidinlehr Psychologisch Entwickelt in Zeitschrift für Volker Psychology. Platonic Ideal Theory Psychologically Developed. Mythologisch Vorstellungen von Gott und Ziel. Mythological Concepts of God and the Soul. Die Deiterische Fantasy und der Mechanismus des Bewusstseins, Poetic Fantasy and Mechanisms of Consciousness, Jüdische Schriften, excerpts have been published in English translation, Reason and Hope, selected writings from the Jewish writings of Herman Cohen, Originally published New York, Norton, 1971 in series, Benai Brith Jewish Heritage Classics with additional material. The Controverse Juissen, Trendelenburg and Kuno Fischer, on the controversy between Trendelenburg and Kuno Fischer. Kant's Theory de Erfahrung, Kant's Theory of Experience. Translated as the Synthetic Principles. Kant's Begründung der Ethik, Kant's Foundations of Ethics. Platon's Ideen, Lehr und die Mathematik, Mathematics in Theory of Platonic Ideals. Das Prinzip der Infin Infinitesimal Method und sein Geschichte. Ein Kapitel zur Grundlegung der Erktensekritik, The Principle of the Method of Infinitesimals and Its History, a chapter contributed to critical perception. 
Religion der Vernunft aus den Quellen des Judentums, Religion of Reason out of the Sources of Judaism. Introductory Essay by Leo Strauss. Spinoza über Staat und Religion, Judentum und Christentum. Spinoza on State and Religion, Judaism and Christianity. Von Kant's Einfluss auf die Deutsche Kultur, von Kant's Influence on German Culture, Kant's Begründung der Ästhetik, Kant's Foundations of Aesthetics, The Orientierung in den losen Blättern aus Kant's Nachlass im Philosophische Monatschrift, an orientation to the loose pages from Kant's literary estate. Leopold Schmidt, so that was Herman Cohen. I think we'll go into Neo-Kantianism. In late modern continental philosophy, Neo-Kantianism, German New Kantianismus, was a revival of the 18th century philosophy of Immanuel Kant. More specifically, it was influenced by Arthur Schopenhauer's critique of the Kantian philosophy in his work The World as Will and Representation, 1818, as well as by other post-Kantian philosophers, such as Jacob Friedrich Fries and Johann Friedrich Herbart. Origins, the Back to Kant movement began in the 1860s, as a reaction to the German materialist controversy in the 1850s. In addition to the work of Hermann von Helmholtz and Eduard Zeller, early fruits of the movement were Kuno Fischer's works on Kant and Friedrich Albert Lang's History of Materialism, Geschichte des Materialismus, the latter of which argued that transcendental idealism superseded the historic struggle between material idealism and mechanistic materialism. Fischer was earlier involved in a dispute with the Aristotelian idealist Friedrich Adolf Trendelenburg concerning the interpretation of the results of the transcendental aesthetic, a dispute that prompted Hermann Cohen's 1871 seminal work Kant's Theorie der Erfahrung, Kant's Theory of Experience, a book often regarded as the foundation of 20th century Neo-Kantianism. It is in reference to the Fischer-Trendelenburg debate in Cohen's work that Hans Weihinger started his massive commentary on the critique of pure reason. Varieties. Hermann Cohen became the leader of the Marburg School, centred in the town of the same name, the other prominent representatives of which were Paul Natorp and Ernst Kassira. Another important group, the Southwest German School, also known as the Heidelberg School or Baden School, centered in Heidelberg, Baden, in Southwest Germany, included Wilhelm Windelband, Heinrich Rickert, and Ernst Trultz. The Marburg School emphasized epistemology and philosophic logic, whereas the Southwest School emphasized issues of culture and value. A third group, mainly represented by Leonard Nelson, established the neo frisian School, named after post-Kantian philosopher Jacob Friedrich Fries. The Neo-Kantian schools tended to emphasize scientific readings of Kant, often downplaying the role of intuition in favor of concepts. However, the ethical aspects of Neo-Kantian thought often drew them within the orbit of socialism and they had an important influence on Austro-Marxism and the revisionism of Eduard Bernstein. Lang and Cohen in particular were keen on this connection between Kantian thought and socialism. Another important aspect of the Neo-Kantian movement was its attempt to promote a revised notion of Judaism, particularly in Cohen's seminal work one of the few works of the movement available in English translation. The Neo-Kantian school was, if, was of importance in devising 
a division of philosophy that has had durable influence well beyond Germany. It made early use of terms such as epistemology and upheld its prominence over ontology. Natorp has had a decisive influence on the history of phenomenology and is often credited with leading Edmund Husserl to adopt the vocabulary of transcendental idealism. Emile Lask was influenced by Edmund Husserl's work and himself exerted a remarkable influence on the young Martin Heidegger. The debate between Cassirer and Heidegger over the interpretation of Kant led the latter to formulate reasons for viewing Kant as a forerunner of phenomenology. This view is disputed in important respects by Eugen Fink. An abiding achievement of the Neo-Kantians was the founding of the journal Kant Studien, which still survives today. By 1933, after the rise of Nazism, the various Neo-Kantian circles in Germany had dispersed. Notable Neo-Kantian philosophers, Edward Zeller, Charles Bernard Renouvier, Hermann Lotz, Hermann von Helmholtz, Kuno Fischer, Friedrich Albert Lang, Wilhelm Dilthe, African Spur, Otto Liebmann, Hermann Cohen, Aloy Riel, Wilhelm Windelband, Johann Volkelt, Benno Erdmann, Hans Weihinger, Paul Nathorp, Emil Meissen, Karl Volander, Heinrich Rickert, Ernst Trosch, Jonas Cohn, Robert Reininger, Ernst Cassira, Emil Lask, Richard Honingswald, Bruno Balk, Leonard Nelson, Nikolai Hartmann, Hans Kelsen, related thinkers Robert Adamson, Henri Poincar, George Simmel, Max Weber, Jose Ortega y Gasset, Georgi Lucas, Hermann Weyl. Contemporary Neo-Kantianism. In the analytic tradition, the revival of interest in the work of Kant that has been underway since Peter Strawson's work, The Bounds of Sense, in 1966, can also be viewed as effectively Neo-Kantian, not least due to its continuing emphasis on epistemology at the expense of ontology. Around the same time as Strawson, Wilfred Sellers also renewed interest in Kant's philosophy. His project of introducing a Kantian turn in contemporary analytical philosophy has been taken up by his student, Robert Brandom. Brandom's work has transformed Sellers' project to introducing a Hegelian phase in analytic philosophy. In the 1980s, interest in neo-Kantianism was revived in the wake of the work of Gillian Rose, who is a critic of this movement's influence on modern philosophy, and because of its influence on the work of Max Weber. The Kantian concern for the limits of perception strongly influenced the anti-positive sociological movement in late 19th century Germany, particularly in the work of Georg Simmel. Simmel's question what is society is a direct allusion to Kant's own what is nature. The current work of Michael Friedman is explicitly neo-Kantian. Continental philosophers drawing on the Kantian understandings of the transcendental include Jean-Francois Lyotard and Jean-Luc Nancy. Classical conservative thinker Roger Scruton has been greatly influenced by Kantian ethics and aesthetics. So we have Neo-Kantian philosophy. The Back to Kant movement. A reaction to the German materialist controversy. And we've talked about Hermann Cohen, who became leader of the Marburg School. And he, the other prominent representatives of which were Paul Natorp and Ernst Cassirer. 
Ernst Cassira supervised Leo Strauss. So let's talk about him. Ernst Alfred Cassira was a German philosopher trained within the Neo-Kantian Marburg School. He initially followed his mentor, Hermann Cohen, in attempting to supply an idealistic philosophy of science. School Neo-Kantianism, Marburg School Phenomenology, Ontic Structural Realism, Theses, in English Descartes, Descartes' Critique of Mathematical and Scientific Knowledge, and the Problem of Knowledge in Philosophy and Science in the Modern Age. Academic Advisors, Herman Cohen and Paul Natorp. Main interests, epistemology and aesthetics. Notable ideas, philosophy of symbolic forms, animal symbolicum, ontic structural realism. Influences, Immanuel Kant, Gottfried Wilhelm Leibniz, Hermann Cohen, Johann Wolfgang von Goethe, Friedrich Wilhelm Joseph Schelling, Influenced Leo Strauss, Wilbur Marshall, Urban, Suzanne Langer. After Cohen's death, Cassira developed a theory of symbolism and used it to expand phenomenology to a, of knowledge into a more general philosophy of culture. Cassira was one of the leading 20th century advocates of philosophical idealism. His most famous work is The Philosophy of Symbolic Forms, 23 to 29. Through, though his work received a mixed reception shortly after his death, more recent scholarship has remarked upon Cassira's role as a strident defender of the moral idealism of the Enlightenment era and the cause of liberal democracy at a time when the rise of fascism had made such advocacy unfashionable. Within the international Jewish community, Cassira's work has additionally been seen as part of a long tradition of thought on ethical philosophy. Biography Born in Breslau in Silesia, modern-day southwest Poland, into a Jewish family, Cassira studied literature and philosophy at the University of Marburg, where he completed his doctoral work in 1899 with a dissertation on René Descartes' analysis of mathematical and natural scientific knowledge entitled Descartes' Critique der Mathematischen und Naturwissenschaftlichen Erkenntnis, De Descartes' Critique of Mathematical and Scientific Knowledge, and at the University of Berlin, where he completed his habili habilitation in 1806 with the dissertation Das Erkenntnisproblem in der Philosophie und Wissenschaft der Nürnzeit. Band, the Problem of Knowledge in Philosophy and Science in the Modern Age. Politically, Cassira supported the Liberal German Democratic Party, the DDP. After working for many years as a private docent at the Friedrich Wilhelm University in Berlin, Cassira was elected in 1919 to the Philosophy Chair at the newly founded University of Hamburg, where he Lectured until 1933, supervising, amongst others, the doctoral theses of Joachim Ritter and Leo Strauss. Because he was Jewish, he left Germany after the Nazis came to power in 1933. After leaving Germany, he taught for a couple of years at the University of Oxford before becoming a professor at Gothenburg University. When Cassira considered Sweden too unsafe, he applied for a post at Harvard University, but was rejected because 30 years earlier he had rejected a job offer from them. In 1941, he became a visiting professor at Yale University, then moved to Columbia University in New York City, where he lectured from 1943 until his death in 1945. Cassira died of a heart attack in April 45 in New York City. His grave is located in Westwood, New Jersey, on the Cedar Park Beth El Cemeteries 
in the graves of the congregation Habonim. His son Heinz Kassira was also a Kantian scholar. Influences. Donald Philip Vereen, who published some of Kassira's papers, kept at Yale University, gave this overview of his ideas. Kassira as a thinker became an embodiment of Kantian principles, but also of much more of an overall movement of spirit stretching from the Renaissance to the Enlightenment and onto Herder's conception of history, Goethe's poetry, Wilhelm von Humboldt's study of the Kavi language, Schelling's philosophy, der mythology, Hegel's phenomenology of spirit and vicious conception of the aesthetic symbol. Among many others, Kassira's own position is born through a mastery of the whole development of this world, of the humanistic understanding which included the rise of the scientific worldview, a mastery evident both in his historical works and in his systematic philosophy. Work, History of Science. Kassira's first major published writings were History of Modern Thought from the Renaissance to Kant, In accordance with his Marburg neo-Kantianism, he concentrated upon epistemology. His reading of the scientific revolution in books such as The Individual and the Cosmos in Renaissance Philosophy, 1927, as a platonic application of mathematics to nature, influenced historians such as E. A. Burt, E. J. Dijksterhuis, and Alexandra Coyer. Philosophy of Science In Substance and Function, 1910, he writes about late 19th century developments in physics, including relativity theory and the foundations of mathematics. In Einstein's theory of relativity, he defended the claim that modern physics supports a neo-Kantian conception of knowledge. He also wrote a book about quantum mechanics called Determinism and Indeterminism in Modern Physics. Philosophy of Symbolic Forms. At Hamburg, Kassira discovered the Library of the Cultural Sciences founded by Abby Warburg. Warburg was an art historian who was particularly interested in ritual and myth as sources of surviving forms of emotional expression. In Philosophy of Symbolic Forms, 23 to 29, Kassira argues that man, as he put in his more popular 1944 book, essay on man is a symbolic animal whereas animals perceive their world by instincts and direct sensory perception humans create a universe of symbolic meanings Kassira is particularly interested in natural language and myth he argues that science and mathematics developed from natural language and religion and art from myth the Kassira heidegger debate In 1929, Kassira took part in a historically significant encounter with Martin Heidegger in Davos. Kassira argues that while Kant's critique of pure reason emphasises human temporality and finitude, he also sought to situate human cognition within a broader conception of humanity. Kassira challenges Heidegger's relativism by invoking the universal validity of truths discovered by the exact and moral sciences. Philosophy of the Enlightenment Kassira believed that reason's self-realization leads to human liberation. Maslisch, 2000, however, notes that Kassira in his The Philosophy of the Enlightenment, 1932, focuses exclusively on ideas ignoring the political and social context in which they were produced. The Logic of the Cultural Sciences In The Logic of the Cultural Sciences, 1942, Kassira argues that objective and universal validity can be achieved not only in the sciences, but also in practical, cultural, moral and aesthetic phenomena. Although into subjective, objective validity in the natural sciences derives from a universal laws of nature, Kassira asserts that an analogous type of intersubjective, objective validity takes place in the cultural sciences. The Myth of the State. Kassira's last work, The Myth of the State, 1946, was published posthumously 
at one level it is an attempt to understand the intellectual origins of Nazi Germany. Kassira sees Nazi Germany as a society in which the dangerous power of myth is not checked or subdued by superior forces. The book discusses the opposition of logos and mythos in Greek thought, Plato's Republic, the medieval theory of the state, Machiavelli, Thomas Carlyle's writings on hero worship, the racial theories of Arthur de Gobineau and Hegel. Cassira claimed that in 20th century politics there was a return with the passive acquiescence of Martin Heidegger to the irrational, irrationality of myth, and in particular to a belief that there is such a thing as destiny. Of this passive acquiescence, Cassira says that in departing from Husserl's belief in, a, in an objective logical basis for philosophy, Heidegger attenuated the ability of philosophy to oppose the resurgence of myth in German politics of the 1930. Partial Bibliography Leibniz System in seinem Wissenschaftlichen Grundlagen The Problem of Knowledge, Philosophy, Science and History since Hegel Kant und die Modern Mathematik Substance and Function and Einstein's Theory of Relativity Kant's Life and Thought Philosophy of Symbolic Forms Language, Mythical Thought and the Phenomenology of Knowledge Language and Myth The Individual and the Cosmos in Renaissance Philosophy Erken Tinnis Theory Nebst den Grenzfragen der Logik und Denkpsychology Die Idee der Republikanischen Verfassung Kant und das Problem der Metaphysik Bemerkungen zu Martin Heidegger's Kant Interpretation Philosophy of the Enlightenment Determinism and Indeterminism in Modern Physics Historical and Systematic Studies of the Problem of Causality The Logic of the Cultural Sciences An Essay on Man The Myth of the State Symbol, Myth and Culture Essays and Lectures on Ernst Cassirer Ernst Cassirer The Gesemelt Work, Hamburger Osgabe, Electronic Edition. The Warburg Years, Essays on Language, Art, Myth and Technology, translated and with an introduction by S.G. Lofts and A. Calcagno. So that was Ernst Cassirer. Um... The only one we've left out of this little group uh, was basically his supervisor, which was Paul Natorp. Paul Gerhard Natorp was a German philosopher and educationalist, considered one of the co-founders of the Marburg School of Neo-Kantianism. He was known as an authority on Plato. Thesis, Descartes' theory of knowledge is study in the prehistory of criticism. Other notable students, Nikolai Hartmann, Martin Heidegger, Ernst Cassirer and Karl Barth. Influences Ernst Lass, who was his supervisor, and Hermann Cohen. Biography Paul Nassault was born in Dusseldorf, on the son of a protest, Protestant minister, Adelbert Natorp, and his wife, Emilie Keller, 
From 1871, he studied music, history, classical philology, and philosophy in Berlin, Bonn, and Strasbourg. He completed his dissertation in 1876 at the University of Strasbourg under the supervision of the philosopher Ernst Lass, and in 1881 completed his habilitation under the neo-Kantian Hermann Cohen. In 1885, he became extraordinary professor and in, in 1893 became ordinary professor in a philosophy and pedagogy at Marburg University, a position he retained until his retirement in 1922. In the winter semester of 1923 to 24, Natorp conducted an intensive exchange of ideas with Martin Heidegger, who had been called to Marburg and whose work on Duns Scotus Natorp had read very early on. In 1887, he married his cousin, Helene Natop. They had five children. Natop was an ambitious composer who wrote chiefly chamber music, including a cello sonata, a violin sonata, and a piano trio. He also wrote some 100 songs and two choral works. He conducted a correspondence with Johann Brahms, who dissuaded him from becoming a professional composer. He was an influence on the early work of Hans Georg Gadamer and had a profound effect upon the thought of Edmund Husserl, the father of phenomenology. His students included the philosopher and historian Ernst Cassirer, the theologian Karl Barth, and the author of Dr. Shivago, Boris Pasternak. Works. Descartes' Erkentnis Theory, Sozial Pädagogik, Logik in Leitsatzen, Gesemelt Abend Lugen zur Sozial Pädagogik, Pastelotzi Leben und Lehr, Die Logischen Grundlagen der Exakten Wissenschaften, Philosophie, Ihr Problem und Ihr Problem. Sozial Idealismus, Beethoven und Wir, Plato's Ideen Lehr, Plato's Theory of Ideas, An Introduction to Idealism, Allgemeine Logik, Erkenntnis Theory und Logik im Nukantianismus. So that's all there is on on Paul Natorp. Um, he seems like an interesting character, though, to have influenced Karl Barth. Um, just going to have a quick look. There's not much on Ernst Lass, so we might as well just finish with him. Ernst Lass was a German positive philosopher. Biography. He was born at Furstenwald. He studied theology and philosophy under Friedrich Adolf Trendelenburg at Berlin and eventually became a professor of philosophy at the University of Strasbourg, 1872, in his Kant's Analogien der Erfahrung, Kant's Analogies of Experiences. He keenly criticized Immanuel Kant's transcendentalism, and in his chief work, Idealismus und Positivismus, Idealism and Positivism, he drew a clear contrast between Platonism, from which he derived Transcendentalism, and Positivism, of which he considered Protagoras the founder. Lass, in reality, was a disciple of David Hume. Throughout his philosophy, he endeavours to connect metaphysics with ethics, and the theory of education. His chief educational works were Der Dusch, Alstatz in den ersten Gymnasieklassen and Der Dusch Unterricht auf Hohen Lehrenstalten. He contributed largely to the Wertel Jahrschrift für wissenschaftliche Philosophie the Literarischer Nachlass, a posthumous collection, was published at Vienna. So that's Ernst Lass, who 
sounds interesting too. So these are all the the people surrounding Leo Strauss and his kind of background in Neo-Kantianism.